and Innovation of the European Commission, and I have the pleasure to moderate this webinar, which will last until 12.15. The purpose of the webinar is to offer practical insights for cultural heritage institutions in Europe for accessing EU cohesion funds, to obtain fast, reliable broadband, internet connections, up-to-date IT equipment, and maybe even training for upgrading the IT skills of their staff. Such cohesion policy support can be crucial to be able to fully profit from the benefits of the upcoming cultural heritage cloud for which my unit is in charge. We have an opening speech and then four presentations on the agenda, giving insights into the functioning of the EU cohesion policy, followed by three concrete examples of ERDF funded initiatives relating to the digitization of cultural heritage. Let me thus welcome our distinguished speakers. First of all, Mrs. Joanna Drake, Deputy Director General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, who will give an introduction in the minute, followed by Mr. Hirun Fanul, Policy Officer in the Unit for Smart and Sustainable Growth in the Director General for Regional and Urban Policy of the European Commission, and then we go to the concrete examples with Mr. Marinos Ioannidis, the director of the UNESCO chair on digital cultural heritage at the Cyprus University of Technology, Mrs. Antonella Pina, director of the museums, archives and library services of the Umbra region in Italy, and last but certainly not least, Mrs. Karina Bandere, director of the digital development department of the National Library of Latvian cultural heritage. Before we get started, some small housekeeping reminders. We will have time for a questions and answers session after the presentations, but please post your questions already from the start via Slido. There's no need to wait until the last presentations. It will rather give us a little bit of time to look into the questions that you have. The Slido link is available on our platform from which you follow the event, or you can simply scan the provided QR code, which you see on the screen right now, I hope, to connect directly. And if that doesn't work, please open slido.com and type in the code cohesion funds for cloud. Now, I'm excited to hand over the virtual floor to our Deputy Director General, Joanna Drake, who will deliver an opening speech and set the stage for, I hope, a dynamic and informative discussion. Thank you, Joanna, um, for being part of this important conversation. And let's embark on this journey together towards more connected and digitally inclusive future for cultural heritage. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katia, for that uh, very um, already comprehensive introduction as to where we want to head. And uh, I'm very excited to be part of this. And thank you for allowing me to be part of this and to frame uh, the whole discussion today. So colleagues, members of the Cultural Heritage Cloud community, definitely a great pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar, A Cloud for All, Accessing EU Cohesion Funds. You may recall that uh, the online workshop in March of this year, in which the former Commissioner Gabriel kickstarted the formation of a community of practice around cultural heritage cloud. This community until today has reached approximately a thousand stakeholders already, from the cultural heritage institutions, including research institutions in the sector from across Europe. In this workshop today, um, we made the commitment to actually, in the workshop then, we made the commitment to explore the possibilities to mobilize beyond the Horizon Europe investments in setting, setting up the cloud's digital platform. Additional funds for digital infrastructure, equipment and training to ensure that all relevant stakeholders in the field of cultural heritage research and innovation will actually be able to fully benefit from and use the cloud once it will be up and running. So as a first step, we reached out to our colleagues from the DG for Regional and Urban Policy in view of the support that EU cohesion funds could potentially give. Today, we will therefore explore practical avenues for cultural heritage institutions across Europe to access EU cohesion funds, for instance, 
as regards access to fast and reliable broadband or to upgrade their equipment to be able to fully take advantage of the transformative potential of the cultural heritage cloud and maybe even benefit from IT training. If I am correctly informed, until 2027, there are in 15 of the member states some 3.7 billion euros foreseen for ERDF investments in culture and sustainable tourism too. There are also 2.3 billion euros for digital connectivity. And in 24 of the member states, some 11.3 billion are in different programs to help, in inverted commas, reaping the benefits of digitization for citizens, companies, research organizations, and public authorities, close inverted commas. Maybe a small share of these funds could be invested for helping the cultural heritage cloud community. Food for thought. But let me have a look back to remind you of how it all began. So it was autumn of last year that there was a stakeholder survey which aimed to gather the views of the cultural heritage stakeholders on the specific challenges and needs that the sector faces. Reveals that the digital transformation of the cultural heritage sector is one of the biggest challenges. More specifically, Numerous cultural heritage institutions, especially those situated in rural and remote areas, are struggling with internet connectivity and outdated IT infrastructure and equipment, and they have a big need of upskilling their staff. This survey also revealed a high interest of the sector in a digital collaboration platform for cultural heritage related research and innovation, and this is what the cloud will contribute to. It will play a key role in opening new avenues and opportunities for digitization of cultural heritage related to research and innovation. You may, however, be wondering now why access to fast and reliable broadband internet, up to date IT equipment, and upskilling of users is actually essential for accessing and utilizing the European Cultural Heritage Cloud. Well, the Cultural Heritage Cloud is designed to connect cultural heritage institutions and professionals across the Union. Fast and reliable broadband internet is crucial for seamless connectivity, enabling these institutions to access and share digital assets without delays or without any disruptions. It ensures that users can interact with the cloud-based resources efficiently, fostering collaboration and also knowledge exchange. Managing digital object objects within the cultural her heritage cloud requires advanced IT infrastructure. For well, this up-to-date IT equipment is necessary to handle the processing, the storage, and the retrieval of large volumes of digital assets. It also ensures that cultural heritage institutions can work with their digital objects in a more efficient and sophisticated manner, leading, leading to improved curation, preservation, and accessibility of cultural heritage materials. The success of the cultural heritage cloud relies not only on technological infrastructure, but also on the skills of the users. Upskilling programs are necessary to empower cultural heritage professionals to navigate and utilize the digital tools provided by the cloud effectively. Informed users can make better decisions about how to leverage the capabilities of the cultural heritage cloud adapting to the evolving landscape of digital technologies and addressing challenges posed by the digital transition, as well as developing innovative ways, preserving and valorizing cultural heritage. Having premised all this, the impetus for today's webinar stems from these needs and challenges. The Cultural Heritage Cloud holds immense potential to revolutionize the way you safeguard and showcase a rich tapestry of cultural assets. However, for this potential to be fully realized, we must address the digital shortcomings that exist among cultural heritage institutions. But our objective is clear. We need to provide you with practical insights and guidance for navigating the intricate landscape of the EU coherent structural funds. 
Now, today, through the presentations of a representative from the European Commission's DG Regio, Regional and Urban Policy, we'll, who will explain how the cohesion policy funds work, as well as the testimonials for cultural heritage solutions or institutions, sorry, which have already received and managed such funding, we shall embark on a journey together to hopefully unlock the doors to these resources, to empower cultural heritage institutions, to embrace the digital era and fully profit from cultural heritage crowd for the future research and innovation activities. Throughout the session, please do not hesitate to post your questions and comments via Slido as Katya outlined earlier. Already thanking you for joining us on this crucial endeavor, it's a journey, but I'm sure that we, your continued support and engagement and our shared vision we shall elevate and preserve our cultural heritage in the digital age. And I look forward to the enlightening discussions that lie ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joanna, for these introductory words and for setting out a bit the landscape in which this uh, webinar takes place. And uh, yes, we have quite a lot of work ahead. So um, without much ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Herun. Could you tell us uh, for 15 minutes round about um, how do cohesion policy funds work and uh, how maybe could they support the uh, cultural heritage clouds community getting a bit more connected and a bit more digitally savvy? Kirun, over to you. Yes, good morning, Katja. Glad to be here. Let me first try and share my presentation. Okay, this should work. If not, then you'll be the first to tell me. Um, yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I was asked to to give an introduction to uh, to the cohesion funds and to uh, give an answer to the, the question: How do uh, the cohesion funds work? Of course, that is not a not a question that that is easy. Uh, to answer, uh, certainly not in, in 15 minutes, but I'll give you a, uh, a taste. Uh, I think it's important that we first establish the, uh, the framework of. Uh, that we first establish the framework of the. Um, of the, of the cohesion, uh, the cohesion funds, cohesion policy. Uh, why is that? Uh, it is important that uh, within an internal market in the European Union that the different uh, member states, the different regions uh, are growing towards each other in, uh, in, in welfare, in economic, uh, economic strength, uh, because in an internal market, the stronger centers will attract even more so uh, or economic activity. So in was just mentioned that especially in rural and outermost regions, uh, uh, institutions are struggling to uh, to keep up, and that is indeed where cohesion policy comes in to uh, to to lend a hand. Um, it is a policy that is uh, place based, so it is a development. It, it's based on development strategies of regions and integrated uh, strategy. Now, of course, you see these uh, policies uh, from 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 your perspective, from your sector. But it's not just, uh, say, computers or or a museum. It's also the uh, the employment around it, uh, the skills, uh, uh, as it was just mentioned, um, and. The more the more integrated those approaches are, the more impact they can have. Um, so yes, let's move to the next slide. So here you see the uh, European Union uh, as it is, um, and basically all the territories are in principle eligible for a subsidy from the cohesion. Funds, uh, the cohesion funds being the European Regional Development Fund, the cohesion fund, uh, the European Social Fund Plus, and also the Just Transition Fund. But I'll 
limit myself to primarily discussing the European Regional Development Fund because that is the fund that is uh, most likely to uh, to be able to fund your project. Um, for the programming period 2021-27, there is a total of 392 billion euros available for uh, for uh, developing developing the regions for cohesion policy. Um, of course, it very much depends on the uh, the area where you live, whether that is a more developed region, as you can see, for example, the Netherlands, that's uh, where I come from, or Sweden, um, or whether you live in a transition region, uh, or whether you live or your business is in a less developed region. The impact is that, uh, or the, the consequence is that the uh, the rate of support is lower or higher, uh, of course, in a less, a less developed region. The, uh, the, 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 the support rate is higher than in a more developed region. Cohesion policy in 2021-27 is divided into uh, or is based on, on, on five cohesion policy objectives. Uh, one being the or the first one being the so-called smarter Europe that focuses on research and innovation uh, and, and support to small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, the support the, the second one is the greener and carbon free Europe that is more the su sustainable development uh, policy objective, environmentally sustainable that is, uh, a more connected Europe. Uh, that is uh, focuses on transport. By the way, here it says also digital networks, but actually those digital networks are part of the smarter Europe. It was in in hindsight, it was decided that it would make more sense if it was part of the uh, the first policy objective. Then there is a social uh, social Europe that uh, primarily financed by the European Social Fund, although the ERDF is also involved there, as I will show later. Uh, that uh, focuses on the uh, the labor market, uh, uh, employment skills, and, and education infrastructure. And finally, last but not least, Europe closer to citizens, where you have uh, more opportunities for locally led development strategies, uh, and urban urban development programs, but also uh, rural uh, development programs. Within those policy objectives, there are many, or there are a number of specific objectives, so to speak. Um, because a smarter Europe, I mean, it has, it is, uh, when it comes to research and innovation, there are many aspects, uh, of course. It's not just the, uh, the reach, uh, research infrastructures, but it also uh, enables SMEs to develop or to expand their, uh, their, their, their businesses. Uh, there's also a skills uh, part. Uh, digital services, and as I just uh, indicated, the uh, digital networks, the ICT connectivity is part of this uh, specific objective. Um, for this webinar, it is the, uh, the other relevant uh, policy objectives are uh, in, inside the policy objective for the social Europe, where there is followed possibilities to support projects in education and culture and tourism. And the objective five uh, urban and rural areas can also support uh, uh, innovative uh, projects uh, in urban and rural areas where there might also be a possibility for, uh, for your project to receive financing. But of course, that depends very much on the uh, as I said, on the program that applies to your area, because uh, there is always a choice in prioritizing certain uh, specific objectives or certain uh, strategic aspects. And it might be that it is or is not part of that program. Um, I think in most programs will have a if not all, will have a research and innovation policy objective. Uh, but for example, development of urban areas might be uh, accommodated somewhere else. 
Um, so presuming that these relevant specific objectives are part of the program that applies to your area, um, I will go through them quickly. Um, uh, the policy objective one, where it comes down to developing and enhancing the capacities of research uh, institutes and the innovation capacity of SMEs um, is a specific objective, uh, but also the digitization uh, exercise, and that can apply to both citizens as well as companies, research organizations and public authorities. Uh, you must be aware that those two should also be part of uh, the so-called uh, smart specialization strategy within your region. I mean, there must be a, a, a rational approach to which uh, aspects of uh, smart specialization have a priority in your in your area. Um, the digital connectivity, when uh, that that is a part that's actually kind of separate. Uh, because it often involves a major infrastructure to uh, to establish a very high capacity broadband connections and also for that uh, there should be a national or regional broadband plan where there has been an inventory has been made of of, of the so-called white spots of those areas where indeed EU assistance uh, is essential to establish the connections or to get uh, everybody connected, uh, especially when it comes to uh, that can be both the uh, the uh, the different digital infrastructures uh, and uh, but especially the um, the so, so called last mile connections as. Uh, internet connections, broadband connections might depend very much on what is commercially the most interesting uh, for, 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 for internet companies to, uh, to provide the links to. Um, but as I said, there might be areas where there are, uh, where there's less interest and here it should be, uh, that, that is where you, you funds could have a big, big added value to, uh, to realize those connections. Um, within policy objective five, there is a possibility for the ERDF to intervene, uh, focusing more on culture and, and, and tourism, uh, and many museums are involved, uh, or, or research institutes are involved in promoting, uh, their research and promoting their, 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 their scientific, um, uh, activities, um, and within policy objective five, as uh, there's an option that uh, a project might be part of a bigger urban development uh, approach. Uh, for example, in a, an area in a in a city or, or area where you have uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, museums uh, that 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 are also connected to to tourism activities, for example. Here I have taken a magnifying glass and uh, give a bit more uh, insight into what kind of what the, what the scope of the investments might be, the, the, the activities that might be uh, supported. So research and innovations uh, or, or, or investments in fixed assets. Uh, but also IT services, uh, digital skills that, that can be developed, uh, broadband infrastructure, uh, information and communication technologies, um, and, and, and cultural heritage and cultural, uh, cultural services. And what a rough figure is that on an EU scale, there is 23 billion uh, available for that. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, it very much depends, or it, it, it depends on the program, or the, that is that uh, that covers the area where your activities uh, take place. Now, it is uh, not so difficult to find out uh, uh, where uh, where to go um, to 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 see if the project that you have or that you want to set up 
could be eligible for uh, for support because of course the cohesion policy funds i mean they are uh, implemented through shared management uh, here in brussels we only t take care of the, of the of the sort of the the bigger framework the the uh, uh, whereas the actual uh, uh, grants are are and, and, and project selection is done on a regional or a local level depending on the managing authority that uh, that that manages uh, the programs in your area and that could be a, a regional administration could be a local administration um, but it is possible to find out where how to contact these managing authorities if you haven't if you are not familiar with that uh, already. Uh, now, it's not just the uh, uh, the mainstream cohesion policy programs where you could uh, that you could check to see whether uh, your project would fit into that into that framework. Uh, there's also the interreg uh, transnational programs, and uh, we, there will be a, uh, a a practical example uh, after me. Uh, where uh, I think it's 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 the the Cyprus uh, project that is being financed uh, under the uh, the Interreg program. Uh, now, who can apply? Well, that can be that that is very varied. Uh, all kinds of public bo bodies, uh, micro and and small and medium sized enterprises, uh, universities, as uh, NGOs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, also there, there might be a uh, more specific conditions uh, in the program. Um, so that is something that you uh, want to find out. Uh, it's always good that, uh, well, I mean, you can, you can contact these organizations, uh, you know, no matter whether you have a project idea or whether the project that you want to uh, want to apply uh, a subsidy for is is uh, a very mature project um, the selection criteria are also decided on on a local and uh, on and, and regional uh, level depending on on the program um, so and if it's not cohesion policy, uh, there could be other more appropriate uh, funding sources. For example, you know, Horizon Europe, uh, or 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 even the the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility. So I hope this uh, gives you an idea of the of the bigger framework in which this webinar uh, takes place. And uh, I would now like to give the floor back to Katja and see whether there perhaps might be questions. I will be available for questions, so uh, don't hesitate. And I wish you all the best with this uh, with this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hun, and thank you also for your perfect timing, spot on 15 minutes. And uh, my personal takeaway is that things are a bit more varied in the cohesion policy funding and access to the funding than in Horizon Europe or Digital Europe or the RF. Um, because it depends where exactly you are located. And um, thanks for referring also to Interreg. So not only are there regional or national programs, but also programs that span across different member states or rather neighboring regions in different member states. And I'm very happy to welcome um, Marinos Ioannidis, um, who actually benefited with this DigiArc project from such an Interreg program. Marinos, are you connected? And does your PowerPoint presentation work? Yes. Thank you Wonderful. very much. The floor is yours. Good morning, uh, Europe, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to my presentation, which today is going to uh, focus on key knowledge of the past 
getting access for, uh, with the support of EU structural uh, funds. Who we are? We are a small lab uh, hosting the UNESCO as well as the EU uh, or the European Research Area um, uh, Chairs on Digital Cultural Heritage. Uh, it's our 10 years anniversary this year. Um, our name, Nemosini, from the ancient goddess um, in the Greek mythology, responsible to keep the memory alive of the ancient Greeks. We have uh, full financial support from the EU in total in the last decade of 10.5 million euro, specifically in this uh, domain. We were coordinators in several uh, EU projects from Marie Curie up to P7, Horizon 2020, in different studies and so on. In 2018, we got the UNESCO chair and the EU era chair with a 2.5 um, uh, mono beneficiary um, million euro uh, budget. And in 2019, the Innovation Award of Innovators in Cultural Heritage. And of course, we are financially totally independent, also with the support of uh, the Interreg um, uh, program uh, from the um, uh, Cypriot government as well as from our university. And in December, in a couple of days, we are going to be a research center at the Cyprus University of Technology and we finance 15 researchers working in this specific area. Now, uh, the ID, the identification of our uh, project, DG Arc, is an internet project, finance, regional finance from the budget coming from Greece and uh, Cyprus, uh, started on the 20th of July 2019, ended 31st of May 2023, almost four years. We went through the corona uh, pandemic. Budget 2.5 million uh, euro with a co financing of 85% uh, and 50% from the consortium. And the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sport was the coordinator. Um, the effort of antiquities, of antiquities of Dodeganis uh, was the second partner, the University of Aegean. This is the partnership uh, or the partners coming from the side of Greece and us from Cyprus as a university, and of course, the Department of Antiquities. We had two uh, key stakeholders, stakeholders who were coming from Rhodos, via the island, the geographical orientation, location where we are, and Cyprus in this region of uh, the Europe. And we are doing what? We digitize, we preserve, we protect, we present Cypriot cultural heritage. Here is a part. And why we do it? One of the reasons is, of course, natural catastrophes. We are moving. The island is moving. The island is above the two seismic plates, the African and the ASEAN one. So it's all about protection, but it's also the climate change and um, the uh, human intervention. So preservation, protection, uh, promotion, exploitation of natural and cultural heritage, serving and protecting the environment and promoting the efficient use of resources, improving the attractiveness of area of natural and cultural interest. And of course, now go up to the point, the 2D3 digitization of documentation of uh, documentation, modeling and presentation of cultural heritage. The methodology, the modeling, the visualization, the presentation to the multi-user community, not only to the owners, using the latest and cutting edge technology. And here is where the project gave us over the pandemic a key financial contribution. It helped us a lot to be above the water and also to fly. To fly where? To the cloud. 21st century digital transition time period, extremely important, training the next generation of experts. We are in a university. So the owners, the stakeholders, the authorities, we are those who brought here to the island the expertise of the high tech directly to the owners 
of the cultural heritage to the authorities, to the policy makers. A key example, medieval castle in Haldi, Greece, a northern rock island uh, to the, um, next to roads, and here the small uh, castle. I'm going now to the to the examples just to show to you the the big data created out of that, and that's the reason why we need the cloud and why we are talking about the cloud. Here, two examples, the monuments from Rhodes, UNESCO site, a World Heritage site, and the Halki, uh, Greece. Um, the, um, um, and here, a small example of uh, this, what exists at the moment, or what it has been achieved during the, the project from the two monuments uh, in uh, Rhodes in uh, Halki as well as here in Cyprus, I will show to you a couple of examples. Multi-user community. We don't digitize just for one user or for uh, the authorities. We are digitizing for the entire community. So from the elementary school up to the top uh, best professional, tourist, and so on, a methodology uh, we named that the Mnemosini methodology. We enrich the 3D with the memory, with the intangible. So we brought the monument to talk, to tell us their pains, to tell us their stories, to tell us uh, their knowledge, um, the methodology as such. And I'm flying here just to show to you that we capture even the humidity, not only the 3D, not only the geometry, and of course, the documentation, the memory, small videos here is when the monuments are going to the elementary school, yeah, um, or to the gymnasium, uh, nice videos um, when, the mon when and how the monument uh, has been used uh, here in Cyprus, a small story, not so far away from uh, Limassol, from the place where we are uh, at the moment. Uh, a castle named uh, Colossi. Um, it's just only 50, 55 second uh, video clip. I will let it play. It's just to show that we are approaching the multi uh, disciplinary uh, community of users with this, what we are uh, creating uh, here. Um, I will move to the next one. Uh, of course, at uh, technology in place, the latest, latest, latest state of the art uh, of technology has been uh, here in place, or is here in place. Now I have to mention something. The University of Aegea, the Cyprus University of Technology, the Department of Antiquities, and the effort aid of um, Dodeganese have the same infrastructure. So here locally in Cyprus, when we go to digitize, we go with the Department of Antiquities together. We have the same systems, the same hardware, the same uh, software, and it's uh, this vector that we uh, created, dancing together for the documentation of the past is uh, unique, I will say, in the entire European uh, Union. The complexity, of course, and um, you see how the volume here that we are creating. And here the complexity of the information available from the wall, the different type, it, we have different earthquakes. You see here the different types of materials used for the, the reproduction, reconstruction of the renovation of the wall, uh, the wall to the side, the monument over the centuries, over the time, even in uh, stamps, uh, postal services, the story and all this together. Um, uh, why I bring the Paphos Castle? Because uh, Paphos uh, is nominated as the smart uh, tourism destination city and is profiting again from um, cohesion funds. Yeah. Um, and that's also another one dimension which I'm bringing uh, here. Um, Nevertheless, um, this, what I am presenting to you now, is the language of the architect, is the language of art used again from the colonial time period 
also in sketches, in drawings, and so on. And um, of course, in all the detail available for to use and use. And here, ladies and gentlemen, the identity, the documentation of the identity. An identity is one of the, I would say, major characteristics of the existence of the European uh, Union, the protection of the identity. Um, and of course, all the details available, the documentation, and of course, the ebook. An ebook, which here is the back code, the timeline of the history of Cyprus from the Byzantine, from the Byzantine time, from the Frankish time period, and so on. You can um, scan the code and you have automatically access to the ebook, which is running in any uh, uh, type of uh, devices. Um, it's a nice uh, uh, tool which can be used for, again, uh, for tourists as well as for students and so on. But nevertheless, have a look how it was the Department of Antiquities working here on the island of Cyprus at the beginning of the 21st century. And you see here, yep, a working place, uh, which here, one of the uh, cutting and te technologies in place, a laser scanner, and now the development. And you see the, the high tech in place is touching God, the memory of the past, the story of the past, transferring that where? In places where people have access 24-7. Now here, a training activity with uh, the Department of Antiquities in a castle which is only 300 meters away from here, a landmark uh, of uh, the city of uh, Limassol. Advantages of local institutions, new preachers of communication and cooperation, even if Rhodes is not so far away in comparison to Brussels uh, from uh, Limassol, here we have an excellent bridge of communication and cooperation established, funded by Interreg. We manage to have in place the same high-tech technology so far as hardware and software are concerned. Um, we are very proud to say that with that, what we have in place, we can compete any other institution locally, regionally, uh, on a pan-European level, so far, as uh, this documentation is concerned. Joint sounds... activities, uh, direct investment for the next generation of professionals, new uh -uh. projects and activities, outstanding replacing place uh -uh. for the direct support to policy makers and the challenges. We need more simplification. Simplification for recording. Okay and of course, accessing mm. the cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, to the European Commission giving us uh, the opportunity to present in a such a 10 minutes compressed time period, four years of uh, work and uh, thanks to all the participants. Thank you, Marinos. And on my part, I certainly want to come back to Cyprus and see many things in, in live. I hope we will get your PowerPoint presentation because this was so impressive, the different images and scans and snapshots and so on that you provided that I hope that <clears throat> many of our around about 400 participants will have a look. Thank it's you so pleasure. much. Thank you very much. And you are always welcome. Cyprus is very famous. It is, absolutely. And with that, I move on to another place where there is a lot of cultural heritage and um, lots and lots of experiences <clears throat> also on the digitization side. And I would like to invite Antonella Pina to take the floor and share with us the experiences she had uh, with the Musei On, I probably pronounced it wrongly, project that was funded in the Umbria region. Antonella, can you take the floor? Okay, good morning, good morning to you all. Uh, first of all, uh, I would thank the organizer of this webinar and the hello to your leads and those who follow us in Europe. I share my presentation and uh, okay.
let's um yes the the, the name of project museum and uh, we called augmented visits in the museum of Africa and uh, I'll show you why I like uh, just to put the Umbria in Italy and uh, just in the middle, uh, in the very center of Umbria, and it's green because it's called the Green Art Park of Italy. And uh, Umbria has a considerable, considerable number of museums, 170 average, and a rich cultural heritage in relation to its surface area and population. With the current growth in cultural consumption of the pandemic, the sites are invaluable to promoting the territory by highlighting its cultural heritage. Uh, just to uh, small mosaic of uh, our museum, but I'm not trying to present it. Uh, but Umbria region, the administration, does not have its own museums, but coordinates the municipal and private museums, with the exception of those di directly managed by the Ministry of Culture. The Umbria region also allocates funds for the creation of museum infrastructure, for the renovation furnishing of museums, and for the necessary equipment to improve the experience of visitors. And uh, the region uses its own resources as well as national and European funds to achieve these objectives. While the structural funds are usually the preferred European financial instrument for the cultural sector, in this case, in the case that I'm presenting, we've been able to access the regional rural development funds uh, 2014 uh, 2022. The measure was the 732 concerning basic services and village renewal in rural areas. The sub-measure supports the installation, upgrading and expansion of broadband and passive broadband infrastructure and the provision of broadband access and online government services. The measure aims to encourage more citizens to use the internet in their daily lives by providing easy access to educational, tourist, social, administrative, and other online services and facilities offered by public institutions. And these services can help people, especially those in marginalized areas, to integrate into the community and create a supportive environment for everyone, including the most vulnerable. This condition can also contribute to increasing the attractiveness of the area. Our project has a budget of uh, uh, 3,060 uh, so, um, thousand euros. The museums involved are 10, distributed in different parts of the region. All of them have been restored or set up over the years thanks to the European funding from the regional development. Uh, okay. yeah. Many of them have developed projects for the public thanks to the collaboration with cultural and creative enterprises that have participated in calls again for access to a, a regional development funds aimed to combine the valorization of cultural heritage with the creation of startups. The RTP funding seemed particularly appropriate to meet the need that arose during the pandemic when museums were closed and there was a need to keep in touch with audiences at home on the During this time, we considered that what the equipment could improve the visitor experience and enable museum operators to develop more engaging educational programs, leading to a broadening of their skills. As the RDP funds were directed towards the development of projects related to the employment of broadband in rural areas, our proposal started with an experimental project for 10 museums to which we will provide specific technological equipment for augmented visits in order to further qualify the visit experience in a more advanced sense meeting the needs of the public and offering museum operators the opportunity to experiment with new on-site and online communication. 
The selected museums, which include the Museum of Arts of All Ages, Archaeology, History, and Ethnography, represent a significant sample of the Museum of All the Islands. Located in small villages, they play an important role in preserving local memory and attracting tourists. Just to have a look at a sample of what I'm speaking about. Oh, our project is at an early stage. While I'm not yet able to give an insight into the outcomes of the project for operators or communities, we have considered a likely impact based on our experience during the pandemic. The region is now launching a call for tenders to equip the identified museum with technological tools that would enable the beneficiary institutions to create a collaborative network and a distinctive and unified cultural offer. The technologies, the selected technology consists of providing each or ten selected museum with multimedia information or uh, showcases and a complete set for streaming, 3D printers and other tools like tablet, uh, um, auto studio lights, webcam, uh, Wi-Fi repeater, all the technology that they need to develop their activities. The tools chosen respond to the needs of the operators who are invited to develop projects that take advantage of the connectivity offered by Europe. Their solutions can range from remote visits to broadcast lectures to people without physical respect, from organizing virtual exhibition of objects in different museums to exchanges between schools in different cities. A phase of training and the use of the equipment is planned to improve the skills of the staff. We are also counting on linking new technological equipment to the cultural heritage and digitization programs underway thanks to the youth next generation funding. We are involved in digitization projects with other funds and the project I, I am presenting to you is not a project that will increase digital resources, but it can make use of data that are already available and others that will be disseminated during the course of the project with the PNRR resilience government programs. One of the strengths of the project is its vision of integration between different sources of funding, whether European, national, or local. This increases the effectiveness of the investments made and develops new integrative strategies that update solution to the needs of the business. This is also what awaits us with the new cohesion programs. We have already launched the first call with the new program at 21.7 that once again links muse link museums as well as libraries and theaters to cultural and creative enterprises to develop projects that strengthen the role of culture in economic development and social inclusion. But this will be the subject of the new webinar if you wish. Sticking to today's topic, uh, the name of the project, Museum Mount augmented visit is intended to encourage museum operators to use technology to provide museum visitors with an answer friendlier content tailored to the needs of different audiences. Just as augmented reality has entered the experience of many people as a means of broadening their vision and deepening their perception of things, we want to use museums as a link of, of an answered knowledge forum, starting with an inland areas I leave, give you a small samples of what we're talking about and from our beautiful museums that they enjoy a uh, courage to visit. And uh, I want to I stay here for your questions and thank you for the Thank you very much, Antonella. And um, that raised really my appetite to go back to Umbria. But um, also, I'm I'm intrigued by the increasing use of digital tools that you make, and that is certainly a step into the future. And that brings me to our last presentation by Karina Vandere from the National Library of Latvia, because you also got support from cohesion funds to 
have a project implemented. Karina, are you online? And can you connect? Hi, hi everyone. Hello, hello, and thank you for inviting. Uh, and I wish I would you would uh, hear in Riga today because Riga is wonderfully covered by snow. So those who love uh, winter, I really wish you would hear. So I will share my presentation. And uh, my aim is uh, to tell you a little bit about the largest project in Latvia in the field of digital culture heritage that uh, was financed, actually co-financed by the European Regional Development Fund and the Latvia state. Uh, this is the project that was um, the funding that was distributed through this uh, member state programs. Uh, and we were lucky to be one uh, to get the support for uh, development of uh, cultural heritage field. Um, nevertheless, uh, the project, uh, digitization of cultural heritage content, uh, was uh, this contract was signed in 2017. Um, the planning and lobbying uh, work started already in 2012. Uh, and uh, this was when the National Library of Latvia initiated a working group uh, with the aim and uh, great ambitions to develop a conception of common cultural heritage infrastructure in the country. Uh, this idea was supported by the Ministry of Culture and we continue continued working in a more broad uh, working group, including uh, uh, different cultural institutions from different domains. Um, nevertheless, uh, we worked hard. Uh, we didn't succeed to um, integrate these ideas and issues of uh, digitization of cultural heritage in the national development plan, but we moved forward and continued lobbying work uh, and talking with the ministries and uh, um, this succeeded uh, in 2014 when the European Commission uh, signed the partnering agreement with Latvia uh, and approved this working program for the uh, planning period, period 2014-2020. And luckily, digitization of cultural heritage was part of this uh, working program. Uh, another great milestone uh, is uh, the approvement of the cultural uh, heritage uh, development strategy uh, in 2015. Uh, in the same year, uh, in the same year, we started the uh, development of uh, application uh, for the um, European Regional Development Fund uh, program, and. Um, Therefore, it turned out that uh, actually the biggest challenge uh, was uh, this long planning period and lobbying uh, that in our case uh, took uh, and lasted uh, actually uh, longer than uh, three and four years. Uh, the project uh, was uh, implemented in two stages. Um, this was implemented together with uh, four uh, leading uh, culture and cultural heritage institutions. These are National Library of Latvia, the National Archives of Latvia, the Cultural Information Systems Center, and the National Heritage Board. Uh, the total budget of, uh, of the uh, program of this project uh, was uh, 12 million, uh, and a part of this was particularly uh, for digitization activities. Um, if we uh, speak about challenges, uh, one is uh, what I already mentioned, this uh, early planning and lobbying, what is really necessary to, um, to access uh, European uh, funds. Uh, also long and bureaucratic application process uh, that um, lasted uh, for more than two years, even three years. And impl implementation then 
bus already not so complicated. Uh, however, it also uh, had a huge administrative burden. But the greatest challenge was to um, to work together uh, and somehow to combine ideas and thoughts and different um, traditions and structures uh, from uh, different cultural institutions and from different uh, this cultural heritage domains. Um, we finally were first, for, first uh, actually uh, to sit around one table and think uh, about uh, common uh, solutions. Uh, the project was organized in <clears throat> four main areas and uh, in financial terms, uh, as already you mentioned, uh, was this content digitization. Um, this part uh, included a, one, a, a huge variety uh, of different materials, starting from digitizing text documents till uh, 3D digitization of monuments, experimenting with 3D uh, digitization of museum objects, uh, collecting digitally born art objects and recording intangible values and uh, cultural events uh, and many others. Uh, to ensure this long-term sustainability, we defined and described uh, uh, operational processes related to digital culture heritage. Uh, by this, we succeeded uh, resources optimization. Uh, we also uh, defi defined um, main competence areas around digitization, uh, preservation and distribution of digital culture heritage and establish a competence center that is one of uh, cornerstones uh, already now after the implementation of the project that uh, allows us to sustain competences and infrastructure. Um, the largest and the most complex area uh, was the creation of this um, culture, digital culture heritage platform, integrated system platform. It, in, it included integration of uh, several information systems and, and creation of a common long-term preservation and management infrastructure, including also um, digitization infrastructure. Uh, alongside uh, digitization and development of information systems, uh, we had opportunity uh, during the project uh, significantly renew and supplement uh, digitization infrastructure for archives, museums, and and libraries. Um, uh, we had an opportunity to um, to buy uh, equipment and to develop a mobile set of uh, digitization equipment for museums that can be used. Uh, uh, even now, uh, for uh, any museum that uh, has competence and ability to digitize. Uh, also, this was uh, film digitization equipment and scanners for text documents and software for text uh, post processing and scanners for photo negatives. Uh, what is uh, interesting, we also uh, thought about distributions, uh, distribution part, distribution of uh, um, audiovisual materials that uh, have been digitized during the project. Um, and uh, by this, we provided all regional cultural centers, uh, 29 in total, with video dissemination infrastructure. And to ensure this competence uh, to use equipment, we also organized um, video streaming events. Um, let me briefly uh, introduce you with a picture of uh, the digital culture heritage platform that was uh, one of the most complex parts of, uh, of the project. <clears throat> uh, in the um, the digital library is the most visible part of the digital culture heritage platform. 
And this is a system uh, that ensures unified distribution of digital objects and information uh, search. Um, but the main, uh, the heart of the of the platform uh, forms digital content management and preservation system. Uh, and this system was developed uh, to provide a unified national register of digital cultural heritage objects and unified preservation. It means that uh, mostly every object of cultural heritage that has been digitized in Latvia, uh, in Latvia culture uh, institutions um, uh, is in this system and it prevents duplication of digitization efforts and it facilitates reuse of digital culture content among institutions. Um, two, other, uh, two other systems uh, that are uh, quite innovative uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Latvia and I think also in Europe, uh, these are reference data system and copyright management and licensing system. Uh, a reference data system uh, ensures the management and availability of unified shared cultural heritage reference data pool. Uh, it is a unified knowledge organization system for describing and structuring uh, digital objects. So it helps uh, to describe and structure digital objects. Um, Reference data includes, uh, for example, such entities uh, as person, institution, family, family, place, event, and this data pool is uh, reusable for every institution that enters in the platform. Uh, the copyright management system um, ensures correct determination and also automated uh, calculation of uh, copyrights and related rights. Uh, on the left side of the scheme, uh, you can see uh, these core uh, cultural systems that are integrated and that provide the content to this platform. And among them are, uh, for example, unified uh, national uh, catalog of uh, museums and also uh, national uh, portal of audiovisual uh, materials uh, that comes from the National Archives of the Latvia and many others uh, domain-based or uh, thematical-based uh, collections. The, the Digital Library is a website that enables uh, us to search over nearly 4 million uh, digital objects that come from different cultural heritage institutions and these are more uh, than 500 partners already, archives, museums, libraries, NGOs, uh, and individuals. Uh, the National Library of Latvia is uh, the manager of the platform and also manager of the Digital Library of uh, Latvia. So I really invite you to look into the Digital Library and uh, search for the information, search for uh, values that are related to, uh, to Latvia or um, knowledge uh, that is connected to Latvia. Um, moreover, the um, interface is in, uh, available in English and also we provide the machine translation of metadata. And um, it turned out that this uh, project uh, actually uh, plays a crucial role in the digital transformation of Latvia uh, and Latvia culture. And this is a path toward the European data space for cultural heritage. Uh, and there is also potential to move towards the European collaborative cloud, cloud using this infrastructure. Uh, and this infrastructure uh, would be important for data sharing and reuse in broader sense. Thank you, Karina. I'm looking a little bit on. Ah, yes, you. Yeah, this was my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. Th this was really an extraordinary.
extremely interesting, comprehensive project. Now I understand why it took you four years to actually pull all the actors together, develop the concept, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So very, very interesting. I think you managed to set up sort of a cloud, or if you want to call it data space for cultural heritage already in Latvia. Fantastic. Um, I look at the clock. We have actually only five minutes left for questions and answers. And I think I will jump a little bit to the protocol and throw the questions which rolled in via Slido directly at you. And I think the first questions which I see there um, is about uh, where to find the um, in which program uh, so where can I check in which program which applies to my region, followed by the second question, where can I check the authority funding agency, etc. responsible for my potential idea. So I think that goes primarily to Hirun. I know there is a web page no, on the uh, DG yes. Regios Internet, please. Yes, that's right. Um, or as 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 when I ask my son where he found something online, uh, he just uh, or he says, you know, well, I just Googled it, and then he has an answer within two seconds. Um, but uh, no, there there is uh, in my presentation I, I I put a link or two links actually uh, where you can start to uh, to find out. Uh, but it shouldn't be uh, too hard because every program also has obligations uh, when it comes to uh, to communication and 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 promoting uh, the program. So I would. Uh, um, there was a question from Piotr saying, "Is is my presentation available?" Um, yes, uh, I I have no objection to that. So if you want to share that, then uh, you can access the links the the link. But um, if you go to info regio then uh, in the end you should be able to uh, to find out uh, what you uh, what you are looking for so thank you very much and uh, just to reiterate to all of you and the the question is actually very pertinent it is normally several programs which you may wish to look into so in many countries there are regional programs in addition to national programs that cover the entire country and then you have also the interreg programs, which also have um, a so-called managing authority, which uh, which implements the programs, and um, go through the programs they have, see what are the selection criteria. Selection criteria is more or less like calls for proposal, more or less, um, and um, discuss with the colleagues there. This is my warm recommendation. Um, I see rolling in here a next question. I have heard sometimes you only get around 50% for the costs refunded. Is that correct? So the co-financing in Horizon Europe is relatively high. Um, we fund for research and innovation projects um, up to 100% of the costs. For structural funds, it can be lower, right? Yes, indeed. That depends. That depends on the program or whether you live in a, uh, or whether your activity is uh, of your organization is in a, a more or a less uh, developed region. Uh, and then within that, uh, the managing authority or the monitoring committee of that program may have decided to give a a a a, a not the maximum uh, support, but uh, indeed a lower lower one. But uh, of course, that's hard for me to uh, to know exactly uh, from where I'm sitting. Um, but and indeed, uh, the 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 cohesion policy funds, the regional development fund, might not be the only fund available. As you said, there are also national funds, uh, or perhaps even regional funds, um, which can complement the uh, the uh, regional development fund. Uh, of course, there should indeed you should be aware that you're not going to double fund something if you get a subsidy for one thing. Uh, it, it, yeah, the, and you should be aware that if you then also apply through another with another European program, that there might indeed be uh, it might be refused because you get into 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 double funding. There there should be a 
uh, often there is an own contribution that you have to, uh, or th that can be that you have, have to, uh, that you have to make an own contribution, or it might also be that indeed that uh, the the co-financing is 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 uh, supplied by the uh, by the national by national or regional authorities. Uh, but again, uh, the, a, ma a managing authority or a secretariat uh, of that should should be able to explain that to you. Thank you very much. We, have, we reached officially the end of our timing. I hope I can overrun for two more minutes to take two more questions which are there. There is one on how is the cloud for cultural heritage institutions complementing or building on the Europeana digitization initiative? Be assured it seamlessly integrates with the Europeana's vast digital repo repository and amplifies its reach and impact. Our cloud empowers cultural institutions to collaborate effectively, fostering knowledge sharing and innovation. So we are really out for a use for innovation. And that brings me to a question which I think you have partly answered, Jeroen. Double funding situation, of course, you have to make sure that you do not receive for the same cost item uh, twice funding there. I think our auditors would get extremely irritated from whichever fund you're using them on. And uh, so that brings me to the question, where can I apply for support to broadband internet connection? And you mentioned broadband plans, Hirun, in your introduction, that they are the frame for the broadband investments. Yes, but I, I, I think a project applicants would not necessarily have to worry about that. That That is more something for, for the, the national and regional authorities to show that there is a framework in which these investments are uh, can thrive, uh, that there is a that policy decisions have been made to to allow these investments to be uh, to be uh, effective uh, and efficient. Um, it's it's most likely there will be uh, a a a a funding source somewhere where you can apply perhaps for indeed that last mile connection or or whatever but again that depends on the content uh, of the program uh, to see whether there is a facility that can uh, that can accommodate that so again I, I i recommend try try and get hold of uh the program that applies to your area to see whether uh broadband con connections um and then in, in this case we will not be talking about uh a sort of major masts you know uh, that for 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 broadband connection but more the last mile connection uh and perhaps the the, the it equipment that uh, that that goes with that uh but that is is uh, yeah on in such a as i said it's these programs are in, implemented through shared management but basically the uh the local or the regional authority the managing authority sets the uh sets the framework so that's uh it might very well be that you can get uh, funding for different aspects of your project project either broadband or or research or, or it equipment uh, et cetera et cetera um but from here from brussels i cannot i cannot uh, unfortunately i cannot see that so. yes thank you very much and that uh, I'm signaled that we can technically still have a couple of more minutes. Uh, thank you very much. And that brings me actually to a question on the Museon project. Um, what were the goals? Can you tell us a little bit more goals of the project and the outcomes? Antonella, if you're still there. Uh, yeah. Uh, as I said, the project is in starting phase and we cannot provide outcomes yet. The main goals are to provide museums and operators uh, with essential tools to develop uh, their, their activities uh, for audience, both in person and online, uh, for visitors of uh, any kind, and mainly also uh, disadvantaged people and uh, with special needs. And we also expected that this operation, this project will increase operator skills uh, and at the same time make the museums more attractive and accessible for all the, for all the needs of the audience. But last but not least, uh, demonstrated an even small funding that from different sources, European sources, can be effective uh, when included in an overall uh, vision. Uh, for the announcement of cultural heritage at most. 
Thank you very much. And I have a question to Marinos, actually. Congratulations for your project. And what happened to your IT equipment, scanners and so on after the project was over? I hope they're still fully functioning and used a lot, are they? Are you still online with us? I think I, Marinos seems to be muted. But uh, be assured when the Regional Development Fund pays for something, these, um, the equipment does stay um, in the institutes that benefited. And actually, they have to be used and continue for five years until after the project ended. And I see that Jeroen is nodding. So that is a good yes. one. Yes, if you, if you may allow me, I can give an answer. We are um, a university. Our first uh, duty is to educate the next generation of professionals. Someone uh, needs to take over when the day comes and we move out. So first, education. Secondly, training, vocational training. For the, we are working with ICOM of Cyprus together. We are working uh, with the Chamber of Engineers together. We are working with private as well as other state uh, entities together. So it's a duty, it's a contribution of the university to the society. Nevertheless, we never stop to digitize the past. And that's the, I would say, number number one priority that we have. And that's thanks to EU funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there I have a last question. And really, I'm afraid it has to be the last one. Karina, um, how does the library determine who the, uh, sorry, the, the wording jumps there. How does the library determine who the users are and how are they led to the right resources for them? Karina, can you give a quick answer? Yeah, thank you for, for your questions. Uh, uh, this is my uh, opportunity to um, announce that actually the digital library is opened uh, just recently in, in the end of the October of this year. So we uh, still are working with um, defining this uh, uh, user groups. But anyway, anyway, uh, one task is to provide uh, correct and trustful uh, data. Uh, so we uh, aim to uh, reach uh, researchers and serve for them. We also want to um, serve for the uh, general public, for users, uh, for every user who wants just to um, use uh, digital cultural heritage for entertainment for for their uh, for their needs. Uh, and uh, by this, we uh, provide different uh, digital collections, internal digital collections, and also um, um, spotlights and, and, and stories about cultural heritage, and also we work on educational materials. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to warmly thank all our speakers. Fantastic, very inspirational. I'm I'm afraid, Karina, Antonella, Marinos, you will get a lot of emails in the follow up and LinkedIn friendships offered and so on in order to find out more how you went about your the setup of the projects, the implementation of the projects, um, getting all the administrative side done. Uh, Karina, you made a point that you really do have, of course, to comply with a number of administrative uh, formalities in order to get the access and I see you sighing. So with that, um, I need to close. Thank you very much for the audience, uh, for the active participation and the many, many questions. Um, if you want to find out more about the cloud, there is on our web page all the useful information which is there. If you are not yet part of what we call the cloud community, please do enroll. There is on our website actually a form sheet. Just fill it in and we add you to our mailing list. And um, I can also announce that um, we will send a newsletter very soon, summing up what has happened. Um, we will upload the presentations, the, um, the, the video from the event today on that so that you can 
uh, live watch that. And um, let me just check for 24. We for 2024, we plan to organize two additional webinars. Um, so hope to welcome you there. We are working by and by through the issues that came up in the survey, which was conducted in 2022. And with that, I wish you a wonderful day and uh, let us carry forward the momentum generated today. Together, we can ensure that every cultural heritage institution is not just equipped, but empowered to preserve and showcase our rich cultural heritage in the digital age. Have a good day and thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. bye.